This is the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth quarter, 2020. Lesson 9 for November 21 to 27, The Church and Education. Read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, November 21. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your church. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to be involved in education. And education is an amazing part of, of our church. We thank you for it and the cutting edge it has in so many areas, but also the ability to remind each of us that we are all students of the word. We pray that as we open your word this week, that your word will jump out at us, that we may see what you want for us individually in our lives. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. Let's read that again. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So, affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you have become dear to us. Since the earliest times in which the faithful have gathered to worship God in synagogues, homes and churches, the Bible reveals people who, through their study of the Scriptures and through their worship, long to know God and to understand His will for their lives. The Bible also repeatedly reveals that the church is a place where serious and relevant discussions should take place, and where people can grow in their knowledge of God and His will for their lives. Sometimes we are afraid of asking questions. However, in the Bible, we often find that questions are used to bring people to a clearer understanding of God. In a similar manner, stories are used throughout the Bible to create opportunities for people to rethink their commitments. Jesus was particularly focused on this type of education with his disciples and followers. If the church is to be a place of education, it must provide the space for genuine dialogue to occur. Just as we were repeatedly told as students in school, there is no dumb question, we must provide within the church a safe environment for each person to grow in grace and in understanding of God and His plan for their lives. Sunday, November 22. True Christian Education The story is told of a rabbi who, looking into the sleepy eyes of the young men who sat in his classroom, asked, Students, where does one know when the night has ended and the day has begun? Several of the students cautiously raised their hands. Rabbi, one asked, is it when you can tell the difference between a fig tree and an olive tree? No. Another student raised his hand. Rabbi, is it when you can tell the difference between a sheep and a goat? After listening to a host of answers, the rabbi announced, Students, one knows the night has ended and the day has begun, when you could look at a face never before seen and recognize the stranger as a brother or sister. Until that moment, no matter how bright the day, it is still the night. Question. Read Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37. What was the point that Jesus was making with this story, and what should this tell us about what must be part of any true Christian education? Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 30. 
Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a certain priest came down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbour to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. As Seventh-day Adventist, we have been blessed with an abundance of doctrinal light and truth. The State of the Dead, the Sabbath, 1844 and the Judgment, the Great Controversy, to name a few things that even most of the Christian world still doesn't understand. And yet, however crucial these truths are, what good do they do us if we are not kind to people, if we display prejudice against others, and if we allow the cultural and social biases of our environment to cause us to treat others as inferiors? True Christian education, if nothing else, must cause us to rise above these human foibles and evils and see others as Christ sees them, beings for whom he died, beings whose sins he bore on the cross, beings for whom he paid an infinite price. If we uplift the cross as we must, then we will see the value and worth of every human being and ideally treat them as they truly deserve, in keeping with the value that God has placed on them. Christian education must include this teaching or else it is not worthy of the name Christian. And so to finish the day... What prejudices does your culture and society teach, either subtly or even openly, that as a Christian you must rise above? Monday, November 23, Call to Live as Light Everywhere we look, it seems as though our planet is turning in upon itself, exchanging light for darkness. Yet we also encounter darkness much closer to home as we consider our own experience in this difficult and challenging world. For we, too, understand the horrors that this life brings us as we struggle with illness, as we deal with the loss of loved ones, as we watch families succumb to separation and divorce, as we struggle to make sense of many of the evil things in our society and culture. Yet, amid this landscape of moral bankruptcy and spiritual darkness, in the midst of all this external and internal noise, we hear Jesus' words to each of us. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16. What do these verses teach us about how we are to live and how, as Christians, what we do impacts how others see God? Sitting in the Sea of Galilee that day under the hot sun, how would Jesus' audience have understood his words? Those who heard his words knew all about light and darkness. Certainly they had much darkness to fear. They lived under Roman occupation in a militarised society that, despite their lack of telephones and computers and the world wide web, in many ways was as efficient as our own, and in some ways even more terrifying. 
The Romans were everywhere, reminding the masses on the hillside that those who insisted on making trouble quickly would find their way to the torturers and to a naked death on a Roman cross. And yet, here was Jesus calling them to live as light, to be merciful, to be pure in heart, to be makers of peace. Christian education must then include teaching our students to be lights in the world, to be able to make choices and decisions that will reveal the reality and goodness of God to others. So, to finish the day, what are the ways that we can indeed point others to the reality and goodness of God? Tuesday, November 24, Living as Disciples If the Church is serious about being a force for Christian education, it is imperative that we begin with Jesus. Jesus called disciples. He trained them to do mission by walking with them. Jesus provided opportunity for them to be involved in the lives of people whom they were to care for and to love. And daily, Jesus challenged them by his vision of what this world could be when people begin to treat each other as brothers and sisters. Question. Read Luke 4, verses 18 to 23. What is Christ's message to all of us as his followers? Luke 4, beginning at verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has appointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to him and marveled at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is this not Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we have heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. For three years, the disciples watched as Jesus, their teacher, lived out the ideals of the kingdom, ideals announced in his first sermon in the synagogue of Nazareth. Forgiveness, grace and love walked hand in hand with loneliness, commitment and hardship. If there was to be a lesson to be learned, it was the lesson that discipleship is not something one takes lightly. You are a disciple for life, not just for one day. In that lovely book, The Desire of Ages, page 822, we read, The Saviour's commission to the disciples includes all believers to the end of time. All to whom the heavenly inspiration has come are put in trust with the gospel. All who receive the life of Christ are ordained to work for the salvation of their fellow men. For this work the church was established, and all who take upon themselves its sacred vows are thereby pledged to be co-workers with Christ. End of quote. As disciples of Jesus, we today must make certain that Jesus is always the centre of both our fellowship and our worship. It is good to remember that it was Jesus who invented discipleship. Though the rabbis of his day attracted followers, it was Jesus who called men and women to follow him. The rabbis could never have imagined a call so radical as to suggest that being with Jesus was more important than all of their commandments. And, as disciples of Jesus, we not only have respect for all people, but we work to provide the kind of place where all people can grow and develop. Hence, all Christian education must include this sense of mission, of purpose, not just to earn a living, but to do in our own sphere what Jesus calls us to do, to follow in his footsteps of ministering to those in need, and to share with them the good news of the Gospel.
Wednesday, November 25, Seeking Truth Albert Einstein, often regarded as the father of modern physics, wrote, The important thing is not to stop questioning. Curiosity has its own reason for existence. One cannot help but be in awe when he contemplates the mystery of eternity, of life, of the marvellous structure of reality. It is enough if one tries merely to comprehend a little of this mystery every day. Never lose a holy curiosity. End of quote. We do live in a world of mystery, don't we? Modern science has shown us an incredible complexity that exists at pretty much every level of existence. And if it's like that for mere physical things, how much more for spiritual things? Question, what do the following texts teach us about the search for truth for answers? Jeremiah 29 and verse 13. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Matthew 7, 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. And Acts 17 verses 26 and 27. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. And Psalm 25 verse 5. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I will wait all day. John 16.13 However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. And John 17 and verse 17 Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The Bible is full of stories of curious people, very much like each of us, men and women who have questions, fears, hopes and joys, people who in their own way are seeking truth, seeking answers to life's most difficult questions. Ecclesiastes 3.10 reads, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. What does Solomon mean here? Some translate the Hebrew word olam as eternity, and others as a sense of the past and the future. So then, according to this verse, God has placed in the human heart and mind a sense of the past and the future, eternity itself. That is, as human beings, we are able to think about what has been called the big questions about life and our existence in general. And of course, here is where Scripture plays the central role. Who are we? Why are we here? How should we live? What happens when we die? Why is there evil and suffering? These are the questions that seekers of truth have been asking since the beginning of recorded history. What a privilege and what a responsibility to be able to help point these seekers towards some answers now. What is Christian education, if not pointing people to these answers, as found in the Word of God? So to finish today... Why must the scriptures play the major role in answering the big questions in life? Thursday, November 26, Sharing Our Lives Question. Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. What is Paul saying here that we could and should reflect in our schools and churches? 
First Thessalonians 2, beginning at verse 6. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Confronted by the breakdown of community and society, we live in an age in which the biblical understanding of the church has never been more meaningful. As Matthew 18.20 reminds us, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. The New Testament vision of what church and community is took shape primarily in the homes of the believers. It was here that the community met in small groups, praying, singing, celebrating the Lord's Supper, learning and sharing Jesus' words with each other. These worshipping groups also became the first church schools, as this was the place in which new members were introduced to the Bible and to this new life that was found in Jesus. Paul's writings, such as Romans 12.2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, suggests that the church took this work of education most seriously. These early believers soon discovered that it is in community that the gospel can best be lived out. In community, we have reason to sing louder, to pray more fervently, and to be more caring and compassionate. When we hear others speak of God's goodness, we sense how good he has been to us. When we hear of one another's struggles and hurts, we sense God's healing in our own lives, and we experience a renewed desire to be instruments of his grace and healing. In today's passage, Paul is asserting that the gospel of God is everything, the power of the cross, the resurrection of the Lord, the promise of his soon return. There was simply no better news in all of the world, and Paul spent his life abandoned to the challenge of, first and foremost, sharing the story of Jesus with the greatest integrity and commitment. Yet, here Paul suggests that the message of the gospel can best be understood, can best be experienced through the act of sharing life together. We must never forget that people are closely watching to see if our lives illustrate the message of grace that is found in the Bible. And so to finish the day, think hard about how you live and ask yourself, what kind of witness am I to those around me? Friday, November 27. In the Desire of Ages, page 299, we read, Christ disappointed the hope of worldly greatness. In the Sermon on the Mount, he sought to undo the work that had been wrought by false education and to give his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and of his own character. Yet, He did not make a direct attack on the errors of the people. He saw the misery of the world on account of sin, yet he did not present before them a vivid delineation of their wretchedness. He taught them of something infinitely better than they had known. Without combating their ideas of the kingdom of God, he told them the conditions of entrance therein, leaving them to draw their own conclusions as to its nature. The truths he taught are no less important to us than to the multitude that followed him. We no less than they need to learn the foundation principles of the kingdom of God. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions this week. One, Robert Louis Stevenson was born in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1850. Stevenson recounts how one night, as his nanny was getting him ready for bed, he slipped over to the window and saw a captivating sight. It was a lamplighter going from one gas lamp to the next. With childish delight, he called his nanny over to him and said, "'Look at that man! He's punching holes in the darkness!' 
What role has God given you in bringing light and love to your community? If you are not sure, invite several church members to sit with you and discuss what you might accomplish together. 2. If the church is to partner with God in reaching out to the world, we must embrace Jesus' words and ministry. The very reality of the Incarnation, of God coming to us, to live in our world, to struggle and to laugh and to cry with us, reminds us that we are called to care for those around us. How will you do this? How might you employ the young people in your congregation to help with this work? 3. Think about the responsibility that we as Seventh-day Adventists have to teach others the wonderful truth that we have been given. How can and should the local church play a key role in teaching these truths to others? At the same time, how can the church be a safe place to discuss these truths with those who are asking hard questions about them? What can you do to create an environment in which serious questions can be addressed? And four, in class, talk about the cultural biases of the society where you live. What are ways your church can teach others to rise above those biases and follow, instead, the teachings of the Scripture? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Internship Crisis in France and it's by Andrea McChesney. Elizabeth Berber was dismissed without explanation only a week into an eight-week hospital internship in France. She was devastated. She needed the internship to pass second-year exams. If she failed, she would lose her stipend for food and housing. Her family lived far away in the West Indies. Elizabeth fell to the ground and wept. As she cried, she felt impressed to call a friend. Three times she sensed that God was telling her to make the call. Finally, she called. I lost my internship, she said. The friend was surprised. Do you believe in God? she asked. When Elizabeth confirmed that she did, the friend gave her the phone number of another hospital. Call this number if you believe in God, she said. Elizabeth knew it would be difficult to obtain a second internship on such short notice. She wondered what to do. Then she remembered that she had an emergency phone number. Before leaving for France, she had received a number from a Seventh-day Adventist woman in the West Indies. If you ever have trouble in France... Call my sister Vivian, the woman said. Elizabeth had accepted the emergency number out of politeness, but now she was so distressed that she called Vivian and told her about the internship. Only God can help you, Vivian said. The only thing we can do is pray. She asked whether Elizabeth had a Bible. It was covered with dust, but she had one. You're going to memorize Psalm 91, Vivian said. Make that psalm yours. When you repeat it, remember it is about you. Elizabeth wept as she read Psalm 91. Her tears left wrinkles on the page. Then she called the hospital to inquire about a last-minute internship. Call back in three days for our decision, a woman told her. She prayed and fasted for three days. She cried. She memorized Psalm 91. On the third day, the woman offered Elizabeth an internship. You're lucky, she said. The boss didn't want you, but changed his mind at the last minute. Emotion overwhelmed Elizabeth. That night, she could not sleep. She realized that God had given her the internship. At 4 a.m., she called Vivian. Is something wrong? Vivian asked. Don't worry, Elizabeth said. Please take me to the Adventist church. Elizabeth went on to be baptized and to receive a master's degree in France. If I had not surrendered to God that day that I called the emergency number, my education would have ended, said Elizabeth, 27. God can do anything. With Jesus, I have succeeded. And there's a lovely photo uh, of Elizabeth there on the left. And so 
A final sentence here today. Thank you for your Sabbath School mission offerings that help people in France and around the world learn about Jesus. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.